I'm Michelle Malik and you're watching in this special. Human rights organizations collectively refer to what's happening in Yemen as, as the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. With an already hellish situation for the millions of Yemenis, they are now also having to face the shock of a pandemic and the repercussions that come with it. UNICEF warns of how this will specifically impact children, pushing the number of malnourished children to 2.4 million and millions of others to the brink of starvation. Let's take a closer look at the situation as it unfolds. Now joining us for this conversation is Ms. Riona Mekomak, who's a spokesperson for the Norwegian Refugee Council, Yemen. She joins us from Dublin. Also joining us today is Ms. Kokab Altebani, who is the co-founder and director of Women for Yemen. She joins us from Istanbul. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Ms. Tebani, I'd like to begin with you. Now, as we talk about the situation getting worse, with the pandemic, let's take a step back and discuss how it was already the worst humanitarian crisis in the world before COVID-19 struck the region. It has been like um, COVID-19 is, is um, a crisis for any normal country. So you can imagine how it would be for, for a country that has been suffering for a conflict and co uh, severe consequences from, um, you know, um, a very horrible war. Um, imagine the infrastructure has been uh, affected immensely. Uh, the conflict has left people without uh, uh, services, without uh, uh, children. And, and since we're talking about children, uh, children are without, um, they, they don't have uh, access to, to, um, to proper uh, nutrition. And children don't have access to good education. They don't have good access to health. Many of them dropped schools so they can, and also they join, um, you know, some, they, they do some work. And um, unfortunately, some of them are already uh, recruited in, 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 in the current military fights by um, armed groups. And many of them also have been killed or maimed because of uh, the conflict. And imagine the accumulation of this, of the conflict over the years how the, the, the high percentage of malnutrition and the high percentage of the low immunity in the country, how would it be? How can a country like this, with this uh, uh, horrible and, 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 and unprepared uh, infrastructure, would be able to face uh, COVID-19? Right, definitely. You speak about the malnutrition here, the various issues, uh, the weak health infrastructure, all of that that is happening and now is um, everything is being exacerbated because of the pandemic. When we talk about the main reasons for why this is happening, UNICEF claims that a large problem has to do with the decline in funding. What situation are we looking at because of those decline in funds? Declining of funding is an issue now because apparently um, the UN couldn't raise enough fund. Uh, but also, like for us, we think conflict is, is a major issue, and peace is prerequisite if we want to to um, to resolve this issue. And um, um, just like um, if you look at also the situation, almost 20 percent of uh, the health facilities are functioning, and now this like many health facilities have shut down because of the decline of funding. And um, unfortunately, the world is not looking at Yemen as a priority to support. So uh, we have um, we have slow support, slow uh, response to Yemen's situation. Right. I'm going to jump to Ms. Rayona McCormack and talk to her about this funding issue a little more. Uh, Ms. McCormack, now about 75% of UN programs in war-torn Yemen have ended or been reduced as funds dry up. When we talk about the entire aspect of humanitarian relief during this time, it was expected that it would decline as, own, uh, as countries' own economic conditions worsen. But what other reasons do you feel contribute to uh, the world contributing less and less to Yemen? The situation funding for funding in Yemen is dire. There's no other way to put it at the moment. We have less money at a time when we have more needs than ever before. Um, as Director al Tabani has pointed out, COVID-19 is worsening the situation on almost every front. There is at the moment a $1 billion gap, uh, both for continuing essential life-saving services and for scaling up support for COVID-19-related activities. 
the money that was pledged this year is simply not sufficient. And as UNICEF has pointed out, without urgent funding, food and supplements for children are going to stop. Uh, that's for the 2 million children who were malnourished and over 300,000 children who were acutely malnourished. Uh, so for whom an intervention is the difference between life and death. Uh, it also means immunization programs will close. Children are going to get sick from unclean water because water systems are having to close down due to lack of funding and many will die. It's not just the nutrition programs which are closing, um, but it's also the health sector. Um, funding cuts are cutting payments to doctors and nurses, and we're seeing hospitals closing. This would be serious any time, but during a pandemic, it is simply beyond appalling. Right. I want to point towards one specific issue, which is the lack of transparency when it comes to funds and aid, which is also being cited as a reason as to why people are discouraged uh, discouraged to donate and uh, bring raise funds for Yemen, as you mentioned, during a time when funds are needed the most. What can you tell us more about that aspect of it, the lack of transparency? Yemen is a highly complicated environment to work in. Um, it is an active conflict. There's also the fact of the sheer scale of the needs involved. 80% of the population is dependent on aid. It is the largest humanitarian crisis in the world. And it's exacerbated by other issues like the recent heavy flooding we've had, roads being bombed out, and the need to import most food, food and food and fuel, which Yemen needed to do even before the beginning of the war. But aid agencies are continuing to reach those who are most in need. The Norwegian Refugee Council, for example, assisted over 1.5 million people last year with food, water and other essential aid. For many others, this is a matter of survival. We were extremely disappointed to see the funding levels um, this year. We feel that donors who have failed to put their hands in their pockets need to step up and fill this gap particularly those countries who've been involved in supporting the war. We feel there's a shocking discrepancy between the very, very large amounts of money spent to fight this war mm -hmm. and the low levels that we are seeing being committed to help the people caught up in it. Right. Uh, um, Ms. Tebani, just expanding on that a little more and talking about the issue of transparency, there have been allegations of corruption uh, at the hand hands of those who are responsible for distributing uh, humanitarian relief on ground. Do you think there are ways to solve it given all the structural issues, all the other issues that come with the nature of conflict as Ms. Macromack pointed out? In our network, we have pointed out to this issue, but we have like highlighted that cutting the aid is not, is not the solution. Uh, it's like throwing uh, Yemenis under the track. So, um, but at the same time, we need to work in two pedal uh, lines. First, we need to increase transparency and accountability from all eight organizations. And also at the same time, uh, the international community should support them because eight organizations are facing huge pressure from conflict parties, especially in the, uh, especially the Houthi groups who have been dictating their conditions and they're diverting uh, the aid and they don't allow it to reach uh, people. So we think there should be more, uh, you know, political will on the international community and just cutting the aid. It seems like it's the easiest response towards that. So um, if we need to help Yemenis, you need to put, because, you know, cutting or diverting and, uh, you know, diverting aid is, is a war crime and not allowing people to have it. So this is what, what Yemen lacks, actually, from the beginning, is accountability uh, and justice. And that's also like we get back to how we want peace to happen. We want to hold those accountable to justice and also to have more seriousness from the international community. Um, and also we need, um, for example, one of the one of the recommendations that we have put is to create an independent committee to, uh, you know, monitor the aid. But cutting the aid is not the solution. Yemeni need to uh, you need to receive this aid urgently, and cutting it is not the solution. Right, Ms. Sebani. Now, the response to that that cutting down aid is not an answer to any of this would perhaps be that this is a way to bring about accountability. Because what is the point if aid is not getting uh, getting and reaching those who need it the most? How do we respond to that? Because this is a very, very complicated situation. We, that's what we talked about, is that, that 
when we uh, separate human rights and justice values from the work we do, we always tend to have this catastrophic ends. So from the beginning, we were speaking and um, uh, outlining the diversion of aid and the, um, like, for example, the oppression of this local organization who are trying to work on also supporting peace or supporting, you know, humanitarian values. They're facing huge oppression, oppression. and the international community there keep ignoring this issue. And when it rises and the corruption uh, reached to a certain level, then the, the response is, okay, we cut aid, we cannot, because at one point the donors cannot ignore the corruption cases. And, you know, they are already being asked by the taxpayers. But would it be like if you have been given enough attention from the beginning, we wouldn't reach that. But now it's not too late to put in place a, a, uh, a measure, measures like to monitor and dictate and uh, not dictate, I would say to force the uh, conflict parties to uh, provide uh, aid. And particularly we're talking about the Houthis in the north. And we know this could happen if there is some pressure from, uh, you know, the international agency and the international community. This could happen and the aid organization can continue their work and we can improve the entire processes. Right. Ms. Rayona Mekromak, now this UNICEF report warns that unless U.S. $54.5 million is not received until August, almost 23,000 children who are severely malnourished will be at the risk of dying. Now, August seems to be a very, um, an urgent deadline that has been stated here in order for funds to be mobilized. Do you see that happening in a month or two that there will be enough funds gathered? And if so, how do you think we can get to that point? We feel there's really no alternative. The money is absolutely urgently needed or children will die. So. The alarm has been sounded from months ago, and there's been a, a joint effort from many different aid agencies to raise awareness of the kind of cliff that Yemen faces if the funding doesn't come in. There are a number of donors who have given generously in the past, who have not given to the same level this year. We are still hoping they will step up because the alternative is catastrophic. Um, this with COVID is going to hit the poorest and the most vulnerable people in Yemen the hardest. That is those children who are living in displacement in camps or overcrowded buildings who've been doing so for years, who are malnourished, who are now facing, according to that UNICEF report, a 20% increase. That's a fifth more children dying and becoming severely malnourished if something is not done urgently. So there is absolutely no choice about this. The money must come from somewhere. The money must come from somewhere, but realistically, where can we expect it coming from? I mean, how much pressure is needed at this point in time? Pressure that is not coming in when it needs to. What needs to be done in the international community to get to that movement, get to that mobilization to actually bring in funds? That's the reason why we come on these shows and we speak about these issues, because it is part of a concerted effort to raise that kind of pressure and to point out to people what is going to happen. Uh, we've been sounding the alarm on this, we're sounding the alarm now on the malnutrition programs, and that UNICEF pointed out, we're sounding the alarm on the water shortages and the networks. Um, and we are also continuing efforts with individual governments to, to, to highlight the needs, to show exactly what this would mean. Uh, Yemen. People in Yemen have already suffered through five years of devastating conflict. They are weakened, and they have been hungry for a long time. They've shown remarkable resilience in surviving, and we just cannot walk away from them now. This is not a time to scale back aid. It is a time to step up. The other point is that money alone is not enough. We also urgently need a ceasefire, and this is something we've been calling for for years. Yemen cannot hope to fight a war and COVID, and it's appalling that even with cases now reaching a peak, new research says that we are going to be in peak COVID cases for Yemen for July and August, that airstrikes and fighting are raging on. We are still seeing, unbelievably, hospitals and clinics being attacked. There were three just in April and May alone. 
Uh, in May, we saw uh, children killed and injured in shelling in Hodeida. Uh, just two weeks ago, on the 15th of June, 13 civilians, four of them children, were killed in an airstrike on their vehicle. This is a reckless endangerment of lives. And a recent survey of Yemeni people shows that 95% feel that Yemen cannot fight COVID without a ceasefire, so they support this call to immediately lay down weapons and focus all efforts on jointly battling COVID-19. Right. Um, Mr. As Ms. Macromack states, you can't fight a war and COVID at the same time. There needs to be a ceasefire. But just to highlight how uh, exactly COVID is spreading across the region, spreading in Yemen, can we talk more about that? Because it seems like the rate of spread, the rate of infection is much, much higher than it is being reported. What more needs to be done to bring about greater uh, transparency of how much the virus has spread in the region? The problem is that when you're, when you're talking to parties that governed by war mentality or they don't have enough um, capacity to run the country, then you're asking for a luxurious thing. Like you can't ask like someone who is, is running uh, the country for military purposes to ask them to be more transparent or to be more, um, more uh, responsive to what is going on. We have been seeing reports about how they are hiding and they lacking transparency about the situations of Yemen. So uh, there is an added, um, and of course, this is a war-led um, mentality that we, we we are facing with. And I would agree with the, um, with our um, guest is that um, we need all to tie it back to peace calls, and we need at least now to support the the calls for a ceasefire, which we as women are working now to to push conflict parties to do that because a situation in Yemen cannot you cannot face COVID with conflict um, as it as as the same time we need a break. Yemeni people need a break at least like. We have been asking in some of our initiatives for 90 days break in ceasefire so people can, at least we can respond to this disease and show more responsibility towards that. So it's all tied back to peace and to uh, right. ending conflict if we want really to um, um, to uh, end or to, to cure this uh, situation from Mr. the roots. Mr. Bani, as you talk that the goal, of course, needs to be peace. That That is what we should aim for, not just a ceasefire that is short-lived or one that is even struggled to get to, but long-lasting peace. Do you think, given the situation, people are all across the world are forgetting about the suffering in Yemen? The problem is that uh, the, the, the handling, the peace process is inside Yemen is not is not felt proper, uh, well like handled. And uh, it's because, uh, unfortunately, now you see the conflict parties are part of the, and I'm talking about the regional and international conflict parties, are part of the peace processes, and they are acting as peace sponsors like Saudi Arabia, Emirates, and in some cases, some of the European countries that are engaged in selling arms or supporting some of those countries that are uh, heavily engaged in, in, in the conflict inside Yemen. So unless we see more, uh, you know, commitment to support uh, the peace processes and uh, true handling of the situations and not asking the conflict, local conflict parties to, you know, end, end, end like, for example, now we ask for a step of a longer or other steps, like, for example, now we ask them for a ceasefire, but at the same time, we had, uh, for example, we, you know, there is a regional interest from Saudi Emirates, right. Iran, inside the country, and they're supporting proxy militias, and they're supporting destructive, uh, you know, tactics inside Yemen. And now the countries, uh, and now, like for example, Saudis are uh, supporting peace agreements, which they are already part of it, and they are the reasons of these, uh, based on many peace, um, based on many UN. Uh, experts reports that a coalition is part of the right. undermining of the Yemeni state. So we need not only to rectify the, uh, you know, in, in the, uh, the accountability in terms of aid organization, we right. need to rectify the ha handling, the peace process inside Yemen. We need right. to hold conflict parties 
we, you know, locally, regionally, and internationally accountable and have more responsibility from the world towards ending right. the conflict in Yemen. Right. On that point, I'll have to end the segment here. Thank you so much, Ms. Kwakab Altebani, for joining us from Istanbul. Ms. Rayona Mekromak for joining us from Dublin. We're going to go for a short break, but when we come back, we discuss how the pandemic is impacting children and young adults in South Asia. Stay with us. Welcome back. According to UNICEF, COVID-19 threatens the future of 600 million South Asian children. Decades of work on health and education is receding due to the pandemic. Let's discuss this further. Joining us for this discussion today is Ms. Sabah Said, who is a researcher and a practitioner focusing on education, women empowerment and human rights in Pakistan. She works as a senior program manager at a local nonprofit, Idara e Talimo Agahi. She joins us from Lahore. Also joining us today is Dr. Geeta Anjali Kumar, who's a practicing counselor, trainer and parenting coach. She joins us from New Delhi. She also helps uh, train teachers and principals. Thank you both for joining us and welcome to the show. Before we get to diving into the conversation, let's take a listen at what UNICEF, uh, UNICEF's executive director had to say about the report. In the shadow of COVID-19, the futures of 600 million children across South Asia are being torn apart. Children may be less susceptible to the virus than adults, but the pandemic has upended their lives in unimaginable ways. 430 million children have been locked out of their classrooms. Those from the poorest families have been unable to access online learning or continue their education in any way. Mainly, and especially girls, may never return to school. Vital health services have also been disrupted. This means children are not receiving the vaccination and nutrition services they need to grow up healthy and strong. Progress that's taken decades to achieve is now at risk of being completely destroyed. For some children, lockdown has meant being confined with their abusers. Others have struggled with depression and some have seen suicide as the only way out. This is the hidden pain of the pandemic, and it's likely to get much worse. But there is hope. We need to work in new and innovative ways to protect children from this pain. Millions of children's futures depend on the action we take today. We have no time to waste. Dr. Geeta Anjali Kumar, now as uh, we see the executive directors talking about the hidden costs of this pandemic, which are largely, uh, with everything that we're seeing, the health repercussions, the educational repercussions, but also what is happening with the mental health of children. Tell us about the situation and what is unique to South Asia when it comes to the psychological state of children. Uh, definitely, as the director was talking, there have been some uh, cert certain or I would say very many hidden uh, repercussions which perhaps are not visible to us because all the South Asian countries are fighting with this pandemic. But definitely the invisible uh, fallacies, the invisible repercussions are, uh, are uh, brushed aside the carpet which have been brought above the carpet today in terms of, yes, children not being able to go out and play, children not able to have the real schooling, which is much more than the textbooks, the children being thrusted to on the online mode, they're confined in the four walls, not able to sit with their playmates, not able to actually experience and live the happy childhood, the sharing and the caring that happens, the real playing of games where they actually learn about human relationships, negotiations, conflict resolutions, forming teams, enjoying when the teams, what is the joy of winning, what is the uh, sadness of losing and how do you turn a loss in, how do you make your failure become your victory next time? Those little lessons of life, the children are missing. They do not have anybody to talk to. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the youths, 
where the parents don't have a job or they have a threat of losing the job shrinking of incomes at home so many family members coiled up together in a small room there is no breather the children are facing the gloom of anxiety and uncertainty to such an extent that the pleasure of growing up and looking forward to future is somewhere lost the the the, the life has actually become very dismal for them and whom are they going to share these thoughts and feelings when they were coming to right. school there was a english teacher or a art teacher or a music teacher or a sports teacher with whom they can oh, they could open up they've lost their go to people right. also dr kumar dr kumar just that point i want to pick it as i feel like we ignore this aspect of schooling a lot how important is schooling and going to teachers physical interaction with teachers in the uh, from the aspect of counseling and being able to vent for children I would say the real real education lies in human interactions when we meet people when we talk with people when we hear people about their experiences we actually learn the real lessons of life and our traditional system of education was that only see we have lot of sources lot of educational apps which will give us the lessons of chemistry biology history and geography but who will give them the lessons of human interactions right. when they talk about their feelings they bas- basically learn to communicate right. when they hear somebody feeling they basically learn to empathize uh, with compassion and trust building happens so these are the pillar blocks which are going to set up the future lives right and dr kumar dr kumar, kumar stay with me on that point that's a very important point i want to talk to uh, ms saba said about it but before that i just want to introduce another guest who's joined us mohammad rafaiatullah mirza who's a senior staff reporter at the daily star joins us from dhaka thank you so much mr mirza for joining us and welcome to the show i'm just going to get to you in a bit uh, ms saba said when we talk about schooling and the impact it's been vast all across the world we know that it has transformed from in classroom to online classes which have caused huge disruptions in children's lives but when we talk about south asia specifically there is one very prominent issue which is in access to the internet how widespread is this so first of all i think the crisis of learning enrollment and equity has loomed over pakistan as in many other south asian south asian countries since long during the pre covid times as well uh, we have been into a phase of emergency for the first time in 2008 and then there onwards and rem- it remained a political slogan for each election campaign sharpening the manifesto promises the covid 19 school closures for 4 to 5 months is predicted to exacerbate the learning crisis by 30% or more with learning losses whilst the enrollment crisis by some estimates will slip further by 25% especially for girls as the executive director pointed out in her speech as households may not send their children back to school in this times many organizations have come together to sort of open up low tech to no tech to high tech options to education and see if households are receptive to that while online learning seems to be a very uh, a very it's it's on rise and it's very inspiring to read the stories but we may have to we may have to keep in mind that distance learning might not be the best uh may, might not be the best form of learning in a country like pakistan though there are some 70% of the population where they have access to tv and radios and this however the most hard to reach uh, learners are those that are in, in 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 most need of a reform of a education reform there are almost 41 million children uh, who are enrolled leaving 22.8 million children out of school in pakistan so what do we have for them despite uh, you know get, making learning easier for them and opening up distance learning options it has its own pros and cons the government opened up the channel called taleem ghar which sort of telecast uh, educational content for grade 1 uh, to grade 12 but is it sufficient is it fulfilling the the learning gap that we have for primary and middle and secondary grades secondly are we keeping the linguistic diversity of uh, of of our various regions in our mind when we have this option is there something for disability for equity for inclusion so there are, there are host of problems when we look at online learning it's, it it may it may be the best it may be a very good recovery response one that was given within 2 to 4 weeks of the shutdown and closure of schools but it might need some more it might have to be more thought through in order to sort of yield the outcomes it was meant to because obviously having no interaction at all as as she said earlier is compounding the challenges faced by the system 
Right. Our gov our education institutions were not even ready to face this kind of emergency. A, we did not really invest much on parental engagement at all. And now parents, being the primary caregivers at home, they are tasked with the responsibility of, of making their children learn. So did right. we, as a system, invest on parental engagement? There are some important aspects that I think we'll you know, talk more about during this show and more. Right, Ms. Sabasaid, I'm going to dig deeper into all those points you mentioned, but I want to jump to Mr. Mirza and talk to him about the aspect as a journalist when you're covering this entire pandemic and how much priority is given to, to young adults by governments, what are you seeing? Is there a trend emerging, a pattern all over South Asia or are some countries doing better than others? I have uh, noticed one thing that is the, the, the children, those who are staying in, in the cities like in Dhaka, uh, majority of the children can participate in an uh, online class with their school uh, in Zoom. But uh, what I want to say, most of the students, those who are living rural areas, they do not have the smartphone, they uh, cannot afford the smartphone, and even they do not have the internet access. So. I think the majority of the students, those who are uh, school-going uh, children, are missing the opportunity for distance learning or online online classroom. Right. But, but the one important, one important thing uh, I also want to mention that in Bangladesh, you know, Bangladesh is uh, the, most of the people are uh, the, the 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 garment workers. The garment workers people, uh, children cannot also access the online education system because of the, most of the garment workers do not have the uh, smartphone and cannot afford the access to internet. So I think the most of the children are missing the opportunity of uh, right. uh, Mr. Mirza, I take that point. That's education. a very, very important. All of our guests so far have uh, emphasized on that there is a systematic issue when it comes to online learning that the governments need to address. But when we talk about dealing with these issues, do you think these are prioritized in the government's uh, schemes? And I'm talking across the region. If you can give us examples of Bangladesh, that would be great. Yeah, uh, in Bangladesh, the government has been giving the priority in internet access like the uh, they reduce the prices of bandwidth in uh, some company uh, by by uh, government uh, company like the Teletalk, so so that the more so that more people can access the internet uh, in even in the rural area. But still, it is not adequate. But it is still it is not enough the, for the children those who are missing the online classroom. Right. And I think I do not have the exact data for, of other countries like Nepal, or Bhutan, or uh, India. Uh, so I cannot comment on those is issues. I can only say the Bangladesh. The, the, it is it is not adequate. I I, I want to say that the base, right. there should have much more opportunities for the right. children those who are missing the online classroom classroom because the right. pandemic is. Uh, it, it, it may uh, linger for many more months. Right. So we should take preparations a lot earlier so that the students do not miss the opportunity of the classroom, even right. online. I take that point Thank there, you. Mr. Mirza. It's an important that this pandemic isn't going to be soon, uh, isn't going to be over anytime soon, and we need to prepare accordingly. Dr. Geeta Anjali Kumar, now Ms. Sabah Said mentioned a very specific point that I want to get to that parents were not prepared for what was going to happen, and they large, they are largely responsible for the environment created in the home, especially when it comes to online learning and helping students cope with uh, schooling and the syllabus and the curriculum. Now, as a parent, uh, as a parent and also someone who has been a coach in parenting, what would you say? How can parents deal and cope with the situation? If we are expecting parents to up, uh, to perform this role, which they have to, they do not have any option. 
somewhere the parents also have to upgrade their skills. Very rightly, Sabha said, parents have not been roped in properly. Parents are not skillful enough. That is why we see that all across the globe, we are having a lot of webinars for parents to upgrade their skills in, in terms of how can they Process, uh, they facilitate the process of co-teaching along with the school doing the work. So there are a lot of worksheets which are being handed over uh, for the children to be done at home along with the help of the parents. A lot of projects and research work where the parent and the child can form a team and do their work together. But much before, uh, much before this, I feel, Michelle, that the parental anxiety has to be handled first because, yes, the child has doesn't have to miss on to the education. But much before this, the parent is worried. Will I be able to feed my child properly? Right. Will I be able to look after my, the basic needs of my child and my extended family? So the parent is hard pressed because the money is shrinking in the pockets for lots and lots of parents. So parents will have to upscale their stress management skills. Parents would need a lot of assistance from the government and the NGOs and the other autonomous bodies where alternative uh, working uh, options are available for them. And then only they will be able to assist or facilitate the educational process of their children. Because if these basic needs are not taken care of, I am I can really wonder how a parent can only focus on the education of the child. Because right. an empty stomach, child and a parent cannot sit down and study. Right. Ms. Uh, Sabasai, that point in, in itself, there are many issues. It's not just schooling here. There are many issues, issues related to poverty, issues related to parents lacking the skills themselves. Now, all of these peers combine into saying that there will be millions of children across South Asia, which will be added to the already 32 million children who are out of school. As I said before, this is not a pandemic that is going to be short-lived. It will continue on into the next year. What do you think needs to happen for reforms to take place given this context now? I think it really requires a systems approach you know, as a start, um, we have been. I think as an as a nation, we we are very used to working in silos, and we do not really believe in partnerships and collaborative work. I think this is the time for organizations to step up, and uh, you know, sort of make collaborations very meaningful, and 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 lend support to the government wherever possible, because this is the time that. Uh, that children are facing with, with not only learning crisis, rather also um, crisis of physique, crisis of stress, fear, frustration, depression, and there's not a channel to vent out those feelings because they have been shut down in their homes for, for the past four to five months, and it's not an easy task uh, to sort of make up for the lost teaching hours. So I think that as a nation, we have to really uh, start building in partnerships and make and make some and make some uh, recommendations around because I think as as uh, in, in South Asia and beyond, we have seen great examples of online learning. Every every nation has resorted to this channel in order to compensate for the closure of schools. But whilst a very you know different modalities are available, we have to really think through that what kind of that what which modality would suit which context. One size one 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 solution will, will not fit all purposes. Will not really meet the, meet the needs of the various learners that we have around the country and beyond. Right. So I, I would really suggest that we that we capitalize on those on, on those strengths that we have. In, in, in the, for instance, in Pakistan, where there are more television users, we, the government opted for television support in order to engage learners in their learning. But then we also have to think that how can you know mobile phones be utilized? How can radio channels be effectively utilized? What kind of learning packs be delivered? Uh, how can the teachers who have been sitting in their homes be be better utilized, be better prepared uh, to have those connections right. with the, with their households? So I think it really requires a very systemic reform where right. there is accountability, governance, proper information. I don't think that every household in Pakistan knows about the government reform effort. Uh, what are the health? What are the, what are going to be the health solutions or right. the best program? Uh, or the Said, uh, on that point, thank you so much, Ms. Sabah Said, for joining us from Lahore, Mohammad Rafayatullah Mirza for joining us from Dhaka, and Dr. Geeta Anjali Kumar for joining us from New Delhi. Thank you for watching in the special. We will see you again tomorrow with more stories. Till then, goodbye and take care.